Hi everyone, thanks for sticking out. Um, my name's Aaron Morton. I'm gonna be talking about the Cassandra internals today. As you can imagine, it's a pretty complicated code base to uh, implement a scalable, distributed, fault-tolerant database. So we won't be going through it in great detail. What I hope to do is go through and pull out some of the more important classes and join that back to some of the stuff you might see as a user. So we're gonna see where some of the exceptions are thrown that you see as a user. We're gonna see where the timeouts come from. We're also gonna present a bit of an architectural overview so that if you're looking to contribute to the code base, hopefully you've got a roadmap for where things go. A Little bit about myself, I'm a freelance Cassandra consultant. I live in Wellington in New Zealand. I'm an Apache committer and a Datastax MVP. I've been using Cassandra for about three and a half, four years. So let's start by looking at the architecture for Cassandra. It's a pretty simple diagram. Like I can put clients up there, they make calls to APIs. Those APIs call down to some software components we can call cluster unaware, uh, sorry, cluster aware, which in turn call down to things that we can consider cluster aware. And all those things do is take stuff from memory and put it on disk, take stuff from disk, put it in memory. Pretty simple architecture. If we've got multiple nodes in, in a request, then the cluster aware components talk to each other and then they talk down to the cluster unaware components and we've got a cluster, we've got machines collaborating to process your read or your write request. But we can change the boxes, the labels on those boxes to be something a little more meaningful. We can change the cluster aware com box to say Dynamo because it's really just a Dynamo based system. We can change the cluster unaware box to say database because that's all it is. It's a log structured, column family orientated fast database. So we've got some bits and bobs that do Dynamo and a database and you put it all together and you've got Cassandra. So we can start to think about the API. We can break that up into two different layers. We can have transports and services. And we use Thrift as a transport, and we also use it as a service. Nate was talking about the different architect, the different transports into Cassandra. When we use, and we have this new one called Native Binary, which is new in 1.2, we use JLine in the Cassandra CLI. Uh, we won't talk about that. And RMI as a transport is used, of course, for the JMX extensions. When it comes to Thrift as a transport, Cassandra has some custom Thrift T server implementations. The one that's used is selected by the RPC server type config setting. And the default one is called custom T thread pool server. Uh, there's a custom implementation because it has some things in there that happen when, those, when your client disconnects so it can clean up the state that we keep. There's also a custom T non-blocking server which is obsolete now in 1.2. It's still in the code base so you might come across it. And there's a custom T HSHA server. That uses a thread pool and those threads process each request from a client and then go on to process a different request from a different client. In the tthread pool server, the default one, the threads stick with the client as long as that connection's there. So HSHA is the one, in, is the setting in the YAML to use the HSHA server. The default is custom tthread pool server. And if you don't do anything, your request enters the Cassandra code base pretty much at that custom tthread pool server. Native binary is the new newness. It's beta in version 1.2. Uh, we've heard some talks about the new things that it has. Under the hood, it uses Netty 3.5 to actually implement the server. It's disabled by default, and you can enable it with start native transport in the YAML file. It uses a different port to Thrift. It uses 9042, so you can run both Thrift and native transport at the same time. Because this is some Cassandra code, we can just have a bit of a look now and see how it works. I'm not gonna dig into the thrift code. OAC on this slide is, means I'm talking about a package in the source code, org Apache Cassandra transport package is the, contains native binary protocol. There's a server class in there. 
when it starts up, it creates an execution handler that has between 16 and 128 threads by default. That's the thing that processes your requests on. Those exit the threads in there process one message from a client and then go on and find the next message to process, a bit like the HSHA server. And to do that, it uses NIO under the hood. And the last thing it does is it sets up the Netty server and builds this thing in Netty called a pipeline. Your request goes in through the pipeline and out again. So the steps in the pipeline are things like uh, message encode and decode, message compress and decompress, uh, up to a dispatcher, which processes the message. Native transport supports SSL on the client connections, and the SSL actually just comes in as a different stage in this pipeline. But once the server's up and running, your messages are actually processed by the dispatcher, by message.dispatcher. This gets the message and gets the client state and checks to see if the message is valid for the state that the client connection's in. So we don't want a credentials message if you're already authenticated. Takes the request and executes it. That gives us a response that we can send back to the client. Before we do that, it takes the response and checks to see if we should change the state on, this, on your connection. So if we were authenticating, the request was some requential, uh, credentials, and now you're authenticated, we want to change the state. And then we write the response out to the client. Those messages that that function processes are defined in the messages package. Some of them are here, uh, they're request and response messages. So if you're going to execute some CQL, or if you're going to prepare some CQL, you can see the messages there. There's several, there's several more than what I've included here. They're all documented in the native binary transport spec, which is available in the source tree. So that's the two transports. We can come in on Thrift into the custom T thread pool server, or on native binary into the message dispatcher. At the services level, the API has uh, JMX, the command line interface we used to, Thrift and CQL3. The JMX interface is really important if you're ever like, doing ops or even when you're doing dev, if you want to know what Cassandra is doing, get a handle on what the JMX interface provides you. The management beans that are exposed are implemented all around the code base. They're not in a single package. But they all implement interfaces that end with mbean. And they're all implemented on the class of the thing that they're exposing management for. So there's a storage proxy class. There's an mbean called storage proxy mbean. And that registers with, as, with a name like this. So org Apache Cassandra DB storage proxy. Pretty easy to find. Next up at the uh, API level is the CLI. If you're using Thrift RPC, this is the way you go in and poke around your data outside of your application. If you're using CQL3, you can still go in and poke around and have a look at how it stores that data internally. Um, whether or not you can update that depends a little bit on how your tables were defined. But it's still a really great tool to know. It's a separate app, but the code lives inside Cassandra. The entry point for this is the CLI main. It comes in, connects. You can pass in a file of statements, and it will iterate over all those statements and uh, execute them for you. You can and then go into an interactive mode where it just reads with JLine and processes your statements. Of course, those statements are in an antler grammar, which is also in the code base. And the real processing of those statements happens in the CLI client class. It uses antler compiles the class, and then just has a big switch statement. So it's not particularly complicated in there. It's easy to go in and have a look and see what the CLI is doing. Thrift as a service is something we've had in Cassandra since day one. This is all of the functions that your idiomatic client like Hector or PyCasa expose roughly map back to something on the Thrift interface. It's implemented in a class called Cassandra Server. This does the sorts of things you might expect. It has access control. It has input validation. It maps between the Thrift classes, the Thrift structures, and what we do internally. 
is we don't use thrift inside Cassandra. That thrift interface is defined in an IDL file that's available in the source tree. There's an ant target to build the Java classes from that and uh, ones for Python and, and all the others as well. So the most common function call on the thrift interface is get slice. We can have a bit of a look at that guy. This is Cassandra 1.2. So we're call, doing get slice. We've got tracing, which is new in 1.2. That gets set up. Then we get the client state. And this is where we store things like the key space you've selected and your authentication details. So we use that to see if you've got access to the key space that you're trying to read from. And because this is a pretty common type of operation, we jump in and go into some internal functions to actually do the read. Multi-get slice internal takes your request and just validates it and say, well, have you asked for a limit of minus two columns? Because that doesn't make any sense. Have you specified the column family name? And creates these objects we have called read commands, which encapsulate the type of read you want to do. And we jump into another internal call This one takes our read commands and processes them internally and then maps them back to thrift using a nice function called thriftify. So this is where we're starting to cross from the external API into Cassandra. But we do that fully in the read column family function. This takes our read commands and hands them down to a class called the storage proxy. There's one storage proxy instance per server. And the storage proxy actually comes from what I call the Dynamo layer. So this is the end of your API call. After this, your call is moved into Cassandra proper and is going to be processed by those cluster-aware Dynamo components. We can contrast that with CQL3 and see how that process goes. Your query in CQL3 after it's either come through native transport or come through thrift on a call like execute CQL3, will end up at the CQL3 query processor. Uh, this guy does what you'd expect as well. It has access control and input validation. And what it returns is a message from our transport package. So if this is used by native transport, there's no more work to do because this is what we want to return back. If it's called by thrift, then we have to thriftify the uh, transport message before it can get sent back. CQL3 is defined in an Antler grammar, of course. That's in the code base. Uh, go and have a read of that. It's got some comments in there that make it a little bit easier to understand. And those statements go through a two-phase process to be executed. First, they're compiled by Antler, which creates these things we call parse statements. And they do things like track the number of terms if you're preparing a statement and you've got some terms in there that you're going to bind later on, it, it takes care of that. Uh, it also has a prepare statement, which makes what we call the real the CQL statement. This is the thing that we actually execute internally. Uh, we don't execute prepared statements. These do some additional access controls because now we know where you're going, and validation because we know uh, a bit more about your request. It has a simple execute call on it. Um, some query state and, uh, and variables that you're binding, things like that. If your statement includes a function call, uh, like the token function or the time UID function, they're available in this package. You can go in there. They, they generally have some simple implementations. We can, we can have a look now at the select statement, so the most useful and the most complicated CQL statement in Cassandra, roughly the, you know, the equivalent of get slice that we saw before. It has an inner class called raw statement, which is its implementation of the prepared statement. This is the first thing we generate, generated by Antler. Uh, some extra input validation, and then it prepares it. So it takes the essential syntax tree and now works out, oh, you actually want to get a range of columns. I can like, you know, set some properties. And it builds the select statement. These guys have execute function. And it makes those same read command objects we saw on the thrift side and hands them down to the storage proxy just the same way we saw with thrift. So your request comes into Cassandra into the custom T thread pool server or into the message dispatcher. It then comes down to either the query processor or into the Cassandra server and then onto the query processor. But 
either way, it ends up down at the storage proxy to go and do your read or your write. So that storage proxy is the thing I put in the Dynamo layer. It's the entry point, roughly, into that layer. The other packages we have in the Dynamo layer are the service package, net package, DHT is the hash tree, locator is where the snitch and the um, replication strategy exist, and GMS contains the gossip. So we've seen the storage proxy. This is the, uh, the entry point for all of the cluster-wide storage operations. If you're going to do a read or a write, it goes into the storage proxy. Uh, if it's a cluster-wide, some local operations don't use it. It's pretty simple. You know, it does things you'd expect. It's going to go and find the endpoints your request wants to go to. It's going to check that the consistency level that you've asked for is available. And then it sends messages to stages in the local machine and, ro and remote machines. Those stages are stages in the staged event-driven architecture that Cassandra implements. We'll talk about that shortly. It waits around for a response from all the replicas that it's spoken to and deals with them not responding. It deals with storing hints that are then that can be replayed later on. It orchestrates the cluster-wide read and write. Another important class in this package is the storage service. So this guy uh, is an orchestration or a wrapper class for lots of things we do to do with the token ring, to do with tracking ring state nodes up and down, to do with starting gossip and starting thrift. Uh, and it contains uh, functions to map between nodes and tokens and tokens back to nodes. It doesn't really have the implementation for most of these things in here. It calls off to other parts in the, in the code base. But this is sort of the entry point if you're in, in the collection for all of those functions. Once the storage proxy has used the storage service and some other things and has worked out where we're going to send those requests, it sits around and waits for them to come back. And if we're doing a read, we're going to get a response back from multiple nodes. We might get a response back from two different nodes. And we need to understand, do these things have the same response? Do, is the data consistent? And that's implemented in, in the iResponse resolver interface. Pretty simple. Preprocess means is called when we get a response from a node. So we get one, comes off the wire, called preprocess. Once we've got enough responses, uh, call resolve and check to see if all those responses are consistent. The row digest resolver is used the first time we do a read. So your request comes in. We uh, determine we're going to send it to two replicas, and we ask one of them to give us back the actual data, and we ask the other one to just give us a digest of the data to save on some network overhead. Row digest resolver, when in the resolve function, builds a digest for the data that it got, compares that to the other digests, and if they don't match, all it does is raise a digest mismatch exception. If they do match, it returns back the data it got from one of the replicas, and that's what ends up getting sent back to you as a client. Now, when they don't match, we have to go and run that read request again, a second time, and ask all the nodes involved to return back their data. We don't want digest anymore. We've got to resolve the differences. That's handled in the row digest resolver. So in this guy, we've got the different results. It works out the differences between the responses, creates delta mutations that are sent out to the nodes that are out of sync, and without waiting around for those responses, returns back from resolve the result we should send back to the client. So we can have inconsistent data on disk. We could have nodes that are just dropping mutations because their commit log's full or something like that. But the work that the row digest resolver does means that we can always actually return a consistent result from your, to your client calls. The last response resolver is used on a range scan. So this is where you're saying, get me rows between foo and bar. Uh, this deals with the problem of nodes returning different numbers of rows and different rows. So one replica could return foo and bar, and another replica returns baz. The range slice response resolver handles those differences. So that's used on the read path and not on the write path. But both the read and the write path have this idea of a response handler or a callback. 
This is something that implements an interface from the networking package called iAsync callback. It's a simple interface that just allows the networking package to deliver a message to something in the code that's expecting a message back. So we have a read callback. It has this nice function on it called get, which waits on a condition, and it waits with a timeout. And the timeout is your RPC timeout. That condition is set in the response implementation of the iAsync callback interface. In that response, we check to see if we've received the data. We check to see if we've got the number of nodes we're blocking for, so we're waiting for two nodes. And if that's true, then the condition's set. Otherwise, it's unset and, we have to, and we're waiting. So if something calls get, it will come in here and it might block on that condition. And we'll either pass that because the condition was set or we timed out. If we timed out, we throw a read timeout exception. And that ends up being a timed out exception back to you as a client. So this is where they come from inside the read callback. If the condition's set and we go in and we call the response resolver, that could then throw a, a digest mismatch exception and we have to go and run the read again. If everything's working though, we go through the condition, we call the response resolver, and we've got the result that we want to send back to you as a client call. All this comes together in a function called fetch rows on storage proxy. This is the thing that orchestrates your cluster-wide read in Cassandra. It gets a list of read commands and iterates through them, and it call, it's, builds a list of endpoints. They're sorted according to proximity, so nodes that are closer to you uh, in the same data center, in the same rack, are higher. Um, the dynamic snitch kicks in there as well and might sort them according to their latencies. And then that list is filtered according to your consistency level and whether you've got read repair running. Uh, if you've got a replication factor of three and you do a quorum consistency and read repair is not active, we only go to two nodes. If read repair is active, we go to all available up nodes. Uh, build a digest resolver because we're just starting the read use that digest resolver to construct the read callback and include on that the number of nodes we're blocking for and things like that. Uh, and then generate some messages that describe what we want to happen and send those using the messaging service. Send RR means send request response. And we give the messaging service our callback so it knows where to deliver those responses back to. After we've gone through all those read commands, then we move on to the next part of this function where we iterate through all the read callbacks and call get. Now remember, this can block. So we could block on the first one while the other two have finished, but it won't block if they've already finished when we get to call get. Uh, that get can, those exceptions bubble out of there, the digest mismatch could bubble out and we'd have to go and run the read a second time. The read timeout exception could bubble out and we have to go and uh, return an error back to the client. But basically, this is your read at the cluster level. So the net service that we use to send those messages, it uh, takes care of the low-level plumbing between all the nodes. So it makes sure we've got connections back, uh, input in and out. It has pools and thread pools and queues and stuff to handle all those messages. But what we're going to talk about is the protocol that it handles, that it implements above that. All the messages that are sent between nodes uh, are tagged with a verb. So these verbs are request and response. We request a mutation or we, or we request a read, and then we get back a request response. But for things like anti-entropy, there's a tree request and a tree response. Those verbs then are mapped to these objects we call verb handlers to implement a pretty simple interface is just say do. Okay, we pull the message off the wire, take care of it. But just because we've got an object, we can't run it, what we actually need is a thread to run it on. So the stages that we mentioned before, the things that you see in node tool TP stats, where you see all the different thread pools, are also mapped to verbs. So now we know if a message comes in and it's a mutation, we know we can give it to this class, this object, and we can run it in this thread pool. <coughs> 
And that's what the receive function does. It takes our message, wraps it in this message delivery task, works out what stage that message maps to, gets the thread pool, the execution handler, and drops the message in it. This is happening on a thread that's just doing this. It's just pulling stuff off the wire, working out where to go, and going and getting the next thing. When the message delivery task gets a chance to run, it's over in a thread pool like your mutation or your read thread pool. It looks at the message and it looks at when it was constructed. And if it was constructed more than RPC timeout seconds ago, it just drops it. Increments a counter that says we dropped a message and exits the function. So when you see drop messages in TP stats or you see drop messages in your logs, that's where they come from, the message delivery task. If everything's good, though, we can grab that message, get the verb handler, get that object, and ask it to process the message. The verb handler then understands, oh, you're doing a mutation. I know how to do with those. And it executes on the thread in the thread pool that we've put it onto. So in your mutation thread pool, that's where you process. That's where you run. To understand what nodes we want to get involved in the request, we have a distributed hash tree in the DHT package. This is where your partitioner lives. Uh, it's a, there's a bit more on this interface, but the basic things that you'd expect are uh, get a token for this key and get random token, which is used by virtual nodes when it's uh, starting up for the first time or when you're running shuffle, I think. We've got a few implementations of those. There's the local partitioner. That's used by system key spaces and secondary indexes. It's they're only stored locally. Local partitioner doesn't have any knowledge of other nodes in the cluster. Random partitioner was the default prior to 1.2. Everyone's seen that guy. Uh, Murmur 3 is the default in 1.2 and above. Partitioners talk about tokens. They're basically just a, a, you know, a bunch of wrapper stuff around storing one value. Uh, the bytes token is used by the local partitioner and the byte ordered partitioner. Big integer token was used by random partitioner and long token is used by the Murmur 3 partitioner. Locator is where we have the code that actually takes the token and now consistent mapping uh, consistent hashing mapping, and turns that into, well, you should now go and talk to these three nodes. Probably seen the snitch in there at some point. Uh, its interface is roughly what you'd imagine. The, the idea of the snitch is to say, hey, I've got this IP address. What rack does it live in? What data center does it live in? And also supports a way to order those by proximity. So I'm this node. I'm in rack one in DC one. Please order all these nodes to be the ones that are closest to me. We have our simple and property file snitch and EC2 and a bunch of other ones. On top of that, the replication strategy is the guy that actually says these are the three nodes to go to. It has a function called calculate natural endpoints. And this takes just some position in the ring. And it works out the token range that includes that position in the ring. And then it returns back, then it works out what nodes actually are replicas for that token range. That information is normally cached, and the, the crunchy bit that works that out is in calculate natural endpoints. That's uh, abstract in the base and implemented in simple strategy. And the network topology strategy, uh, the implementation of that has got nice comments in there, and it's pretty easy to understand. And I know that there have been times when People do things with network topology strategy and actually have multiple data centers and racks, and they end up with an unevenly balanced load. If you have a look at that calculate natural endpoints function, you can get a feel for what's going on there. Finally, we have a, a list of token metadata, so uh, a map that goes from token to endpoint, uh, and a map that says, oh, these tokens are bootstrapping, they're joining the cluster. A list of no tokens that are leaving the uh, nodes that are leaving the cluster and a bunch of other things like that. They're just mapping around from one to the other. Last thing we'll look at at the Dynamo layer is gossip. Now, gossip can be a little bit confusing, so I'm trying to not get too deep into this guy. Uh, 
What gossip does is allows nodes to swap values. Uh, each value has a, is a string and it's immutable and it has a version number. That version number starts at zero when the service started, every time the service starts. And every time a new version value is created, the version number is increased. Those version values are used to store values for things we call application state. If you run node tool gossip info, you'll see these come through, the status and load and schema and things like that. And there's a special piece of application state we have called the heartbeat state. This stores the, a version number and the heartbeat is increased every second when gossip runs. And it also has this thing we call the generation number. You can see this bubble out in node tool info. First time the service starts, it gets the current millisecond time or second time, can't remember, and stores that away as its generation number. Every time the service starts after that, it increments it by one. Every time there's some sort of major change on the server, so its token has changed or something like that, it increases it by one. It essentially says this is a new instance of the server. The application state, the version values, and the heartbeat are all used in gossip, which is orchestrated by a gossip task, runs on its own thread pool. And the process here is, is uh, send a sin, send out a, a sin message, get an act back, send an act to. Inside the gossiper, we m make these things called gossip digest, and this says, for node foo, I have generation six, and the highest version value I have is 600. Calculates one of those for every node it knows about, wraps those up in a send message, and then sends them off calling send one way. So we don't expect a response on this guy. We're not using a read callback, but we're still using the messaging service to deliver it. Gossiping goes to one member that's live, one endpoint we know that's alive, if there's a dead end point, we gossip to that with a certain probability based on how many dead end points there are. If we haven't gossiped to a seed by that point, then we gossip to a seed with a certain probability based on how many seeds there are. On the receiving end, we use a verb handler, like we talked about before. Um, it gets delivered that gossip sin message that we constructed makes a call to the gossiper class, and inside the examine gossiper, we look at all those digest messages and do a bunch of things like this. We say, um, the sending message has a, for server foo has a generation of six, and I have a generation of five for that. I'm gonna get that guy to give me everything he knows about that. All the other version values about foo, I want from him. Or the other way, the sending, the sending node has a generation of five, I have a generation of six. I'm going to tell that all of my version values. If the two generations match, then only values which have a, which are, I will send the, the other node the version values that I have that have a higher version number than what it's seen, or I will request from the other node things that have a higher version number. Back on the initiating node, we have the uh, act2 verb handler. This guy calls the failure detector and tells the failure detector, hey, we found out some more information about foo. Um, maybe you could mark it as up. Maybe it was dead before. Um, we can add in there some heartbeat information into the, the latency windows that we track to take nodes down. And then all the information that the other node told us, we will add that to our stuff. So if we now know that node foo has changed to a different version, we'll update that in our list. And we construct the act2 and, and send that guy away. That gets us out of the Dynamo layer. And we got out of the Dynamo layer by calling stages. The stages are listed in, uh, controlled in the concurrent package. There's also a database package down here, which is the actual database. Uh, there's cache, IO, and tracing packages, which we don't have time for today. Stages are managed in this really simple class called Stage Manager. In its static initialization, it creates a map of stages to thread pools, reads your configuration settings. So if you're in your config, it says concurrent rights is 32. It creates the mutation thread pool and says it can have 32 threads in there. 
provides a simple function to go and get that that we've seen before in the messaging service. Those stages are the stages that you see in no tool TP stats, read and mutation and gossip and those sorts of things. So that's about it for concurrent. DB is the actual database. As I said before, this is just a database and then on top of that is this orchestration of Dynamo. The thing that you think of as a key space is implemented in a class called table. I like this because it makes me think of, oh, it's big table. Um, but sometimes that can be a bit confusing if you open up the code and you look at a class called table. We um, open this up all the time. If it's open once, we don't open it again. But you always see calls to table.open to get a reference. It has a function on it called get column family store. That's because the thing that you think of as a column family is implemented in a class called column family store. It has some top level entry points for getting a row and applying mutations. So if you're going to update uh, or read from a table, you go to the table and do it. So we have our column family store. This is the actual column family. It has to read from it, it has a function called get column family. Inside Cassandra, the idea of a column family, not column family store, is just a sorted collection of columns. It's a fragment or an entire row. It doesn't represent the column family itself in its entirety. All the action for doing read happens in a function called get top level columns. Uh, and there's an apply function just like we saw on the table. It has some extra things on there to update in secondary indexes. The column family is abstracted into this idea of a column container. It's got some functions you'd expect, add and remove, and it has two implementations. Column family is used on standard columns and top level, is top level columns. And super column is used for top level columns in a super column family. So this is sort of one of the reasons why most of the developers on Cassandra don't really like super column families because there are these sorts of exceptions and different code paths all through it. The actual mapping of uh, names to columns is handled by things that implement I sorted columns. We have some different implementations here. The array back sorted columns is a thread unsafe, very fast collection. It's used on the read path. It was one of the reasons we got like a big speed, speed boost in like point 0.1, I think it was from memory. That's because this went into the read path and had a lot less contention, a lot less overhead. On that read path, we have one thread doing the reads, and it just needs somewhere to put, put some data. Atomic sorted columns implements the, uses the snappy tree. This came in in uh, 0.11 from memory. This is the thing that says, oh, I, you want to update 50 columns? Well, I'll use snap tree and it's uh, zero copy to do the update and either zero of those 50, zero or 50 columns will be available and visible at any one time. So this is only used on the mem table. Tree map back sort of columns is just another uh, sort of thread safe collection that's used in a bunch of other places. So there's a mem table, that in memory representation of your column family. For once there's a func there's a class that actually just maps straight to the concept, mem table to mem table has a put on it. Um, if you want to understand how it does the writes, that process starts up in the column family store. That works out what mem tables we want to flush. If there's secondary indexes involved, we want to flush multiple because secondary indexes are just implemented as column families inside. That enters the mem table at about this function called flush and signal. And the reason that latch is there is because we're going to count down. Like, we're going to flush the, this column family and its three secondary indexes. It creates a runnable that gets put into the flush writer execution handler. Inside the YAML, you'll see a thing called uh, flush, flush writer queue size from memory. There's, a, there's a, a thread pool and a queue. That queue is normally four by default. And this guy gets dropped in there. When he gets a chance to run, he makes this thing called an SS table writer, iterates through all the rows and the column families that are in here, calls the writer to append 
That writer creates the dash data.db component, creates the bloom filter on the fly, and creates the index, the primary index component, dash index, takes care of all those other components that we have on disk for the SS table. Back to the read path. Here's our read commands that we saw generated in the API layer. Uh, simple interface, call get row, give it the table you want to read from, and you'll get it back. Slice by names read command is used when you say get me foo and bar and baz. And slice from read command is used when you say get me 20 columns after foo. Internally, these guys use these things we call uh, disk atom filters. A disk atom filter is something that can iterate over columns from a mem table or from a one SS table according to some criteria. The identity query filter is used in compaction and repair. This just returns every column. The named query filter is used when we've got a list of named columns. That nowadays has lots of smarts in there to short circuit the process. So uh, we, getting uh, columns by name is the fastest query you can do now sometimes. The slice query filter is used when you say get me all 20 columns after foo. So in general what happens is your request comes into Cassandra, comes into the custom T thread pool server, or into the message dispatcher, comes down to the Cassandra server, or the uh, query processor, converges down into the storage proxy, which delivers a message down into a stage, and that stage could either be local or on another machine. The stage gets that message to run inside a thread pool. We do the mutation, we do the read, we kind of reverse that process back to deliver your responses back, deliver the response back to the coordinator, back through the messaging protocol, and back to the callback handler that we saw that, that the storage proxy is probably waiting on. And that's the entire architecture. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.